Yo, yo, I'm Yovan Buha, Lakers beat writer for The Athletic, and welcome to another Lakers postgame reaction show. I just got back from Crypto.com Arena, where the Lakers lost 134 to 120 to the Golden State Warriors. LA was without Anthony Davis, who was ruled out two hours before tip-off due to headaches and nausea. It's unclear if that was related to the eye injury he suffered against the Timberwolves, or if that was due to the flu-like symptoms that are currently going around the Lakers locker room. Obviously, LeBron has been dealing with that. That's why he missed Sunday's game and nearly missed this game. He told us post-game he didn't decide he was playing until about 55 minutes left uh, until tip-off. And I will say it seems like something is going around. The Lakers canceled shoot-around on Tuesday. They now canceled practice for Wednesday. Uh, I feel like I'm coming down with something. Uh, I'm not feeling great right now. So all around some crappy luck for the Lakers for AD to miss this one. Uh, again, AD has been the Lakers best and most important player this year. Uh, they are now two and four without him. And really you can say two and six because if you look at that Golden State loss and the Minnesota loss, in both instances, AD leaves after the first quarter and the Lakers don't have him for three quarters of a game. So in my opinion, the Lakers are now two and six on the season without AD. Given the stakes and the seeding implications for this game, uh, it was going to be a tough one regardless of whether AD was going to be available or not. Golden State is a prideful group with its own history, so you knew they were going to be locked in for this one. But without AD, you saw the trickle-down effect of LA had some pretty rough defensive stretches tonight their inability to stop dribble penetration and then having to overcompensate by rotating over leaving shooters open and just a, a lack of uh, organization and communication defensively for the most part and then just not having that reliable guy uh, who could attack draymond get him in foul trouble uh, get their you know trace jackson davis or uh, just just be a a beast in the paint and, and control it on both ends. This was a predictable loss once Anthony Davis was ruled out, but it stings nonetheless for LA. They now lose the tiebreaker with the Warriors. Golden State wins the season series 3-1. Uh, so if they do end up with the same record, Golden State will be ahead of them. I'm going to touch on some of the scenarios a little bit later in the show, but it's looking more like the Lakers are going to be in the 9-10 game. But the Lakers, still depending on what happens with Sacramento, uh, what happens with New Orleans, what happens with Phoenix, have a shot to move up and potentially be number eight or number nine. But again, I uh, will touch on that in a little bit. But this was a big loss and the Lakers path to just getting into the playoffs likely became a lot harder tonight. And there's a realistic scenario now where they have to finish the season with two games on the road, play two road play-in games, assuming they win that first one on the road, and if they win both of those, they'd be going into a playoff series against the number one seed on the road uh, in either Minnesota, Denver, or Oklahoma City. So there's a, a chance that the Lakers are on something like a six-game road trip in about a 10-ish day span, 10 to 12-day span. Uh, and, and that's through the first couple games of the playoffs. That's going to be brutal, for uh, especially for a team that's been under 500 on the road, struggled on the road for the most part this season. Uh, it's, it's a tough path but uh, th this is where things are at and the Lakers are going to have to figure it out if they want to make something of this season but let's touch on some of the box score numbers and then we'll get into our three takeaways again final score 134 to 120 LeBron had 33 points seven rebounds and 11 assists in just under 36 minutes an admirable performance from him given the flu-like symptoms he was playing through, given, again, he didn't decide he was playing until less than an hour before tip-off. Uh, we spoke with him post-game, and he clearly was under the weather. Typically, he'll hang out in the locker room a bit after the game, even after a loss, and he'll, he'll be doing something for uh, his upcoming documentary, or he'll be talking to a teammate, to uh, a friend who's in town who comes in the locker room to talk to him, or uh, he'll be talking to us. Or, or just whatever. But the second interview concluded, LeBron beelined out of there and went home. Uh, so he, he clearly uh, was not in that type of mood. And, and just from talking to him briefly, you could tell uh, he was under the weather. Rui had 20 points and 11 rebounds in just under 31 minutes. I was surprised by Rui's minutes tonight. I thought that the Lakers should have played him more. I thought if there was going to be a game where Rui played 35 to 38 minutes, it would be this type of game uh, against the Warriors. Uh, and look, he, he struggled from the field. He was just 7-21. to 21. 
He was blocked several times by Draymond Green and Trace Jackson Davis. Uh, Wasn't the best Rui performance, but just given the Lakers' lack of viable size in this game, it was really just Jackson, LeBron, and Rui. Uh, I think all three of those guys should have been in the 34 to 35 plus minute range. And the fact that Rui only played uh, 31 minutes, uh, Jackson only played 28 minutes, and again, LeBron, I mean, LeBron, given the flu, like, and there was garbage time for, for two minutes. So, like, you, you take off a couple minutes there. Like, those guys in a more competitive game, I guess, Rui's closer to 33. Uh, Jackson's closer to, to 30, although they, they weren't closing with him. So, we'll, we'll keep him at 28. LeBron uh, maybe gets closer to 38. But uh, I think I was a little surprised at how small the Lakers went at times. And I will touch on that later in one of the takeaways uh, Jackson, the 11 points, six rebounds uh, again, 28 minutes, like wasn't a great game, but th- this isn't a great matchup for him. Definitely let Draymond green get into a nice rhythm by playing off of him. Although that was part of the game plan as Darvin ham, LeBron James and Rui Hachimura all confirmed, uh, post game Jackson had a steal, had a block though. And again, compared to going smaller with Torian Prince, Uh, Spencer Dinwiddie, Gabe Vincent, Cam Reddish. Like I I think Jackson should have been on the floor more and probably played closer to 34, 35 minutes. Austin Reeves had 22 points, seven rebounds, and six assists and had some pivotal scoring stretches in the second, third, and fourth quarters where he kept the Lakers in the game. I think LA could have ran more actions for Austin with Steph Curry and, and often the lesser perimeter defender on him. D'Lo had a, a really rough game. Uh, like on the surface, 14 points, seven assists isn't that bad, but he was just three for 11 from the floor and really, in my opinion, got bailed out a couple times. He was six for six from the free throw line because he got fouled on threes twice. Uh, one of them I didn't even think was a shooting foul. I, I was kind of surprised that the call went that way. Uh, another one I-, I think was a foul, but also could have been a foul on the floor. Uh, so like, I mean, you take that away. And he has eight points and, and seven assists, and, and I think it looks a little worse. But even even so, three for 11, not a good shooting performance from him. Uh, and I thought, particularly defensively, like Chris Paul was scoring on him. He was guarding Clay during the starting portions and really did a, a poor job chasing him around screens and sticking with him side to side. So I thought it was a bit confusing, given how much D'Lo struggled on both ends, that he led the team in minutes at 37 minutes. Uh, I think this was a night you rely more on Gabe or Spencer, and and Gabe had a a poor shooting night, so I think Spencer would have been more the answer, but there weren't a lot of great options for the Lakers tonight, again, without Anthony Davis, without Jared Vanderbilt, without Christian Wood. They didn't have their normal front court size, uh, so they did have to downsize, but LeBron's obviously going to play a lot. Uh, Austin had it going. Uh, Rui was a big factor. Like Those three guys all had it going at various points, and we're going to play a lot of minutes. Jackson was in there for LA having a a rim protector, a center-sized body. Uh, But then that fifth spot, I I thought with D'Lo struggling on both ends, uh, those minutes could have gone a little bit more to Gabe or Spencer. And just having those guys guard a Clay, a Chris Paul, uh, whoever's the non-Steph option, or even taking on Steph and then putting Austin on one of those guys. I just thought there were too many times where the Warriors targeted D'Lo. And I went back and watched all 26 of their three-point makes because I probably buried the lead here, but the Warriors made 26 three-pointers tonight. They shot 26 for 41, one of the best three-point shooting performances in NBA history. And part of that is because they're the Warriors and they've had a three-point revolution over the last decade and changed the way that basketball is played. Uh, But part of that was also the Lakers' defense, their game plan, and not having Anthony Davis and the way that it ultimately had a a trickle-down effect, and it affected their backline rotations and and how uh, guys were being left open on the weak side or uh, just miscommunication on on switches and 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 pick-and-roll coverages because guys uh, were in spots that they weren't necessarily used to being in. So, I mean, I went back and looked, and D'Lo was involved in in four or five of those threes, and uh, some of it was failing to get around a screen, like we're messing up on switches, and and the Lakers aren't relying on D'Lo for his defense, but on a night when he's struggling to score the ball, I think the Lakers should have gone in a different direction for at least a few more minutes. I, I just don't think he should have led the team in minutes. 
The bench has been very up and down lately, and this was a down performance for them for the most part. Uh, Torian Prince, two points in 19 minutes. The Lakers were minus 18 in his 19 minutes, which was the worst mark on the team. Uh, Spencer Dinwiddie did make three big threes, uh, and I I thought overall, you know, between defending Steph and Clay, did a solid job. So the Lakers were still minus 13 in his 22 minutes, but I actually thought Spencer was the one plus off the bench overall. Uh, Also had four rebounds. Uh, Gabe went scoreless in his 15 minutes. Cam went scoreless in his just under 10 minutes. Uh, I didn't understand going to Cam in the first quarter over Gabe. Uh, It seems like Gabe is still on a a bit of a minutes restriction, so he's limited to that like 14 to 16 minute range. Uh, But this, to me, would have been a great night to to dust off Max. Uh, I think Max is like Cam blew, got to the rim, blew a layup. Uh, he, he just he's been such a minus offensively since coming back from his injury that I, I just don't uh, like even if you want to make the argument that he's the better point of attack defender, which I don't even agree with. Uh, but if you want to just say he's the he's the bigger player, he's he's the better athlete uh, in comparison to Max. Like Max is a much better offensive player, a better finisher, a better shooter. Uh, he's a better rebounder. Uh, I think defensively they're pretty close, and I would actually lean toward Max defensively, uh, especially in a matchup against the Warriors where I think you have to be technical and and savvy and uh, just a lot. Like I just think Max's strengths translate better to this matchup than Cam's, and for whatever reason, uh, Max didn't play until the final 147, and Cam got uh, a couple of shifts in the rotations. I mean, Cam was another one in going back and looking at the film. Uh, He got screened by Chris Paul, which like, yes, Chris Paul is a fire hydrant. Uh, he maybe it was a slightly dirty screen, but like, I just think if the way you know, Cam is out there to envelop players and in, in, in get in their faces and not give them any breathing room. And he was giving Steph uh, a lot of breathing room at times. So as I said, Golden State 26 for 41 on threes. They shot 59% overall. Lakers shot 46%. Lakers just made 12 threes were 12 of 35. Did win the free throw battle. Uh, rebounding battle was close, 42 to 40 in Golden State's favor. But LA had a, a lot of things go their way. I mean, seven turnovers compared to 15 for Golden State. Uh, they they won the paint battle, uh, 54 to 40. They won second chance battle, 10 to six. Uh, fast break points, 16 to 11. So some of the markers that I had highlighted in my preview for this game went in LA's favor. I mean, ultimately, you make 14 more threes than your opponent. Uh, that's an extra 42 points. And LA was plus six at the free throw line, uh, was minus three overall in terms of field goals made. So like, that's the difference right there. It was just simply Golden State made a bunch of threes, including Draymond Green, who went, uh, what he finished? Five for seven. So he, he went over two in the second half, started five for five in the first half. The most threes Draymond Green has made in a half since 2016 so tied a career high and the most threes he's made period was six in game seven of the 2016 final so this was one of draymond's best shooting performances in eight years which is insane uh but that's i mean how many times have we said that about a role play and draymond's a star so i'm, I'm not going to diminish uh his, his standing in the league but like Offensively, he's, he's more of a role player offensively. He's, he's a star because of his passing and his defense and his leadership and not because of his scoring or his shooting, but the Lakers, the, the game plan was to leave him open at, at the three-point line and they started to adjust and close out to him more, but Draymond entered this game shooting 38% on threes. So I, I don't know if I agree with the game plan to leave him wide open. Like, yes, you have to give up something uh, defensively. There's always something popping up defensively where you, you can't just, you know, you can't play a perfect defensive game. There's going to be some type of weakness in your defense that the offense can exploit. And if Draymond hits five threes, Draymond hits five threes again. We're, we're talking about an outlier performance uh, from a, a make perspective. But the Lakers, I mean, the, the Dante Exum game, uh, Marcus Smart earlier in the season. There's all these different instances where guys who are struggling just go off against the Lakers, and this was the latest one. Although, again, Draymond wasn't necessarily struggling. I mean, it, from a historical perspective, he's been a low-volume three-point shooter. He, he's been a below-average three-point shooter, but shooting 38% uh, on threes this season, you don't want to give a 38% three-point shooter uh, typically wide open threes. And that ultimately was the difference in this game.
My first takeaway from tonight's game is same old mistakes. And I want to preface this with saying the Warriors are better than the Lakers when they don't have Anthony Davis. I don't think that is a controversial statement. Uh, the Warriors were the better team tonight. They should have been the better team tonight. And from that perspective, this loss was not necessarily surprising. Uh, but there were several stretches where the Lakers were in this game, uh, particularly a stretch late in the third quarter where they got within five, uh, but there were there were points in the first half. And the second quarter, they, they ended the, the half with some juice and, and had it within, uh, I think it was like an 11-point deficit at halftime. But to me, a lot of the concerning trends for the Lakers reared their heads tonight. And to me, that was trending smaller than they should have for stretches of this game. And I know there was no AD, no Vando, no Christian Wood. The Lakers options were limited, but it's difficult to outsmall the Golden State Warriors. They have perfected the art of small ball over the last decade. And if you look at the guys that they have, uh, like they bring in these scrappy, defensive-minded, uh, high IQ guards like Brandon Pajemski or Gary Payton II or even Chris Paul. And these guys excel in the intangibles of the game. Uh, they're, they're gritty, they're defending, they're switching, uh, they're getting offensive rebounds, they're making the extra pass, making smart passes, and they're, they're hitting their open shots. But like the, the, the Warriors have a team of solid role players who complement their stars well and play within their system very well. And I just think it's, it's tough to outsmall them. And that's what the Lakers tried to do at different points in this game, playing a lot of Torian at the four, which I have said multiple times on this show is not a lineup that they should be playing in serious, important basketball games. And you saw that, again, the, the bench got slaughtered tonight. And, and the bench has been very up and down in general. But again, minus 18 in Torian's eight, uh, 19 minutes. Uh, minus 13 in Spencer's 22 minutes. Uh, minus 14 in Gabe's 15 minutes. And there was a stretch there late in the third quarter, probably the game ceiling stretch, where LA goes with a lineup to close the quarter of Jackson Hayes, Torian Prince, Spencer Dinwiddie, Gabe Vincent, and D'Angelo Russell. And that's a lineup that's obviously undersized, uh, does not have a lot of rebounding. Like Spencer did have four rebounds, and, and I think he typically tries defensively, tries to box out. Uh, but the other, I mean, Gabe Vincent is six foot one. D'Lo does not, uh, has had some nice rebounding performances in, in recent games, but in general, it is not a plus rebounder, only had two rebounds tonight. Uh, Torian is one of the worst rebounding wings in the league and, and has been. Uh, for for several years so like looking at that and and just the way that they closed that so they're outscored 15 to 3 to end the third quarter and that pushed the Warriors lead to 17 entering the fourth quarter and that was basically it like the Lakers uh, I think they might have got within 10 or, or 9 or, or even 8 uh, they, they got within 8 at one point in the fourth but that was the closest they got the rest of the way they've continued to inconsistently stagger the LeBron Rui minutes and to me, this was a matchup where you probably wanted at least one of those two on the floor at all times, and then mixing in Jackson Hayes and, and, and really trying to keep two of those three on the floor at all times. I just thought that was a, a costly stretch and a game that was close at the time. Again, a five-point deficit uh, for that to snowball into a 17-point deficit going into the fourth. Like That was the difference right there. And, and some of that is just Golden State shooting and, and their offense. And, and again, the Lakers were supposed to lose this game. But they still had a chance to win it, given how great their offense has been, uh, given how LeBron just tends to dominate the Warriors and, and they don't really have an answer for him. And, and given that and the way that Austin was playing and, and Rui was being competitive, even as he was getting blocked and, and missing shots, uh, missing open threes, like I think th they still had a shot to make this a close competitive game uh, in the fourth quarter. To me, the, the, the bench lineups... Like they need to really reconsider, uh, like, like I'm saying, same old mistakes. And, and there's multiple aspects to it of, of just playing too small in general, um, leaning too much on Torian. I thought he had a really bad game, uh, leaning too much on Cam. I, I also thought he, he was uh, ineffective in, during his two shifts. Uh, like these are the, I mean, these are the treads of the season, right? Like this is playing Torian too much earlier in the year, playing Cam too much earlier in the year, going small 
when the team plays its best bigger. Clearly, the team does not trust Colin Castleton, but uh, I mean, maybe you dust him off for a couple minutes and uh, if he gets exposed defensively, then at least you tried something and, and we're trying to problem solve and, and go a little bit bigger. Uh, but I, I just... I think the the going small against this team was a mistake. They had to basically play a perfect game along the margins, and there were some positives to be sure, but uh, to me, it ultimately came down to playing a little bit too small for, for certain stretches, especially in that late in that third quarter, and relying too much on the bench guys. And I, I think, as, as I said, like if you slice uh, some of Torian's minutes and Cam's minutes, give it to Rui, give it to Jackson, give it to Max, I think those switches right there, uh, th this is a closer game. And I'm not saying the Lakers win it because th there were a lot of factors that went against them with, with AD being out, Warriors hitting as many threes as they did. But I think it would have been a more competitive game. And it just continues to be the, the same rotational mistakes, the, the, the same uh, rotational misunderstanding of, of strengths and weaknesses and who's playing well and who's not. And I, I just think... Uh, it was a lot of the, the same old trends from the season rearing their head at an inopportune time. Takeaway number two from this game is this is when your past comes back to haunt you. And what I mean by that is this is when the Lakers losses earlier in the season in November and December and January are coming back to haunt them. And that's where harping on some of those things of the starting lineup. And Torian Prince starting over Rui Hachimura, over Jared Vanderbilt. And not only starting over them, but playing oftentimes 50% more minutes, 30% more minutes, closing certain games over them. And he had some good performances at, in stretches, uh, especially in November and December. But there are a lot of things that I was critical of, that others have been critical of, that were obvious in the moment that were spelled out in both the film and the lineup data. And the Lakers were just too slow to correct those mistakes. And it cost them. Uh, I have some several losses here that I, I think are, are especially costly. At Sacramento earlier in the season, DeMonta Sabonis fouls out. At Miami, uh, they, they lose that one by a point. That's the one, remember, where LeBron kicks at the Cam Reddish and, and he misses that shot late. Uh, at Dallas, the Dante Exum game, uh, like that, I mean, that's that's an all timer. That was one that really upset the locker room and, and set off some of the the warning signs for what was to come in late December, early January, uh, which is really the low point of the season when they lost four uh, four straight games and uh, the locker room was very upset with the coaching staff and the rotation and, and the lineups uh, at San Antonio, losing one of those. Uh, I mean, the Spurs were on, I believe, an 18 game losing streak at the time and that i mean that, that was coming both of those were coming right off the the in-season tournament that was when the lakers had that three and ten stretch that essentially is what got them in this mess of now potentially being the number 10 seed at chicago uh, another rough one home against miami without jimmy butler and caleb martin home against memphis a memphis team that's been one of the worst in the league all season uh home against brooklyn that was arguably the worst loss of the season period. So like, and I'm stopping at January with going back and looking at losses that really cost them, but I'm up to eight losses right there. And even if we say that, sure, you know, you could say eight losses, but like Lakers have several wins that they might not have deserved or uh, got a bit lucky with like, let's just even, let's just say four of these games go in the Lakers favor with playing, you know, starting Rui, uh, playing him 30 to 35 minutes a night uh, playing Torian in a smaller role, playing Vando more when he was healthy, not benching D'Lo at, at Austin for, for stretches. Like if they have the current starting lineup for the, this whole season and, and just a, a rotation that made more sense with the, the success that they had last year and the way that they structured their team and, and the guys that they invested in and fewer Torian Prince minutes, fewer Cam Reddish minutes, like e even four more wins would have them tied with Dallas for the five seed. And in this scenario, they potentially have an extra win against Dallas if they win that Dante Exum game. And then they would have the tiebreaker over Dallas and right now be in the four or five, uh, potentially playing the Clippers in round one, or at worst be the six and potentially playing the Oklahoma City Thunder in round one, a team that they're up three one in the season series against. And the reason I bring up all these previous losses is because the Lakers had no margin for error at this point in the season. And to have a, a freak 
situation happened with LeBron where he gets the flu. And uh, I mean, LeBron typically plays through sickness, but to, to have him miss a game and then be somewhat compromised today, but, but still play through it and still have a good game. Then you have AD getting poked in the eye a couple times. And then now he's sick or you know, missing the game uh, with concussion like symptoms. Although the Lakers say he's not in the concussion protocol, like had they taken care of business earlier in the season, they would have had the wiggle room where even if you lost tonight, you're still in the five or six spot. And at worst, maybe you're on the cusp of like number seven, uh, but to now be at number nine, but really be at number 10 because the Warriors uh, have a couple of easy games coming up. They're, they're going to pass the Lakers at, at you know, by the, the Memphis game, most likely. Uh, like to, to be a number 10 going into the final week of the season, it's because of, of several of these losses. And several of these losses that, you know, there, there were game plan issues with, with leaving shooters or, or just, again, not playing, you know, playing too small of lineups or not playing the right players. And like, these things were were obvious in the moment. It's not revisionist history to go back and say Torian Prince shouldn't have been starting. I was saying it back in December. I, I didn't have this YouTube channel. I didn't have my podcast. But for those listening on Hoops Tonight, I was saying the same things back then. I was very critical. I've never criticized a starting lineup as hard as I did the all-wing lineup in late December when the Lakers benched Austin, Rui, and uh, D'Lo. Like, it, it just... A lot of this stuff was was clear in the moment, and it's come back to bite the Lakers, where now they, they lost their margin for error, and in a critical juncture of their season, when they finally were playing well, they finally had momentum, all of a sudden, freak incidents with LeBron and AD, and now they're in this spot where they're more likely than not going to be the 10 seed and have to win two games on the road in the play-in just to get into the playoffs to then play the number one seed, which might be Denver. And again, this is the reason why I've been harping on the Rui should have been starting from day one, looking at the Lakers starting record with Rui with this lineup, with Rui in general. And I've seen some people push back and be like, well, you know, it, it, they, they finally figured it out and, and, you know, they're playing well now. And it's like, yeah, but they needed to figure it out earlier because now their season is in jeopardy. And, and that's the thing where like every game matters. I know the regular season is long and 82 games is a lot, but there are no puntable games in the regular season, especially in a West as tough as this West is and, and as close as all these teams are in the standings, like two to four more wins. And I think the Lakers would have two to four more wins with the correct starting lineup from day one or even from game 30. This was the fear. This was the concern that something happens to AD, something happens to LeBron, the Lakers lose, and now all of a sudden, they're in a really tough spot entering the plan. And finally, takeaway number three is the Lakers will likely be in the 9-10 game now. So I have a quick breakdown for you. Uh, shout out to Mike Trudell for tweeting these out after each game. Uh, but the different scenarios here for LA in the standings, if the Lakers go 2-0, so if they win against Memphis on Friday and New Orleans on Sunday. Uh, they need the Warriors to go 2-1. and one. So they need Golden State to lose at least one more. And they do play New Orleans, so that is possible. And Golden State does play New Orleans, which makes it possible. But they do also play Portland and Utah. So they should get those two wins. Uh, so Golden State's going to go 2-1 at a minimum, but they could go 3-0. and That game against New Orleans is also in San Francisco. Uh, so Golden State will be favored most likely in that one. So it's going to be a tough one actually for New Orleans. Then Sacramento needs to go one and two. Phoenix needs to go one and two. And New Orleans needs to go 0 oh and three. So if any of those scenarios happen, again, the Lakers going two and oh, and then Golden State going two and one, Sacramento going one and two, Phoenix going one and two, or New Orleans going 0 oh and three. And New Orleans plays Sacramento, Golden State, and the Lakers, so that's that's possible for New Orleans. In any of those scenarios, Lakers jump that team. And technically, they're ahead of the Warriors, but if you give the Warriors the, the couple wins that they're likely going to get, they, they'll jump the Lakers at some point. If the Lakers go 1-1, one one, then they need Golden State to go 1-2, which is unlikely. They need Sacramento to go 0-3. Oh they need Phoenix to go 0-3. Oh and, and it's impossible to pass New Orleans if they go 1-1. One one. So... Uh, if, if New Orleans, and that would theoretically also be New Orleans beating them, not Memphis beating them. Uh, but if, if the Lakers lose, they cannot pass the Pelicans. And given Golden State's schedule, Golden State will likely be ahead of them as well. And then it just comes down to does Sacramento or, or Phoenix go winless, which 
I don't think it's going to happen, though is possible in Sacramento's case. Uh, so th- there's Lakers are likely in the 9-10. Uh, still a, a decent chance they could be number nine, especially if the Warriors drop that game to the Pelicans. But if the Warriors win out, Lakers are likely 10 and, and at highest probably nine. Uh, so still within the, the realm of possibility that LA can move up to eight or, or you know stay at nine. Uh, but it's a lot trickier now and it's out of their control before had they won this game they were going to have the tiebreaker over the warriors and could win out and be ahead of golden state and at least stay at number nine at worst but now the floor is gone the the lakers could be as low as 10 and that's a a realistic scenario if not the most likely at this point at least being in the 9 10 game uh, which is not where they wanted to be they wanted to jump up to seven or eight and we still don't know if if ad is going to be available for that game on friday uh, LeBron theoretically will. There's just a lot of different ways that the, the regular season could go. Uh, like they, they should beat Memphis with or without AD. Uh, I mean, if without LeBron, then it gets a little dicey potentially. But assuming they, they beat Memphis, it really comes down to that New Orleans game. But New Orleans is also going to be playing for something. They could have their seating on the line. It could be the difference between one of those teams being in the 7-8 game and one of those teams being in the 9-10. And New Orleans is going to be at home. So uh, just a, an unenviable position for the Lakers right now. And I just quickly wanted to touch on the seeding scenarios and just lay out that now Golden State has a tiebreaker over them. Sacramento has the tiebreaker over them. And the Lakers have the tiebreaker over Phoenix and currently lead the tiebreaker over New Orleans. But it'll come down to that regular season finale. But that'll do it for tonight's show. Thank you so much for watching and listening. For those on YouTube, please consider subscribing, hitting that notification bell liking and commenting and for those listening on apple Podcasts, spotify or your podcast platform of choice please consider following downloading and leaving a five-star review i'll be back on thursday or friday with episode 12 of buha's block depending on when i can get my guest uh, still working through the timing but i'm looking forward to it and i will talk to you then